Um, I want to give the floor immediately to Olivia, who will uh, lead our panel discussion and introduce the panelists. Olivia, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Jana, uh, for that great uh, summary of the situation of uh, women in employment in the world and some of the opportunities and limitations of independent freelance work and, and the motivations. And I think it's a great, great segue into discussing uh, women joining platforms to undertake, whether it's micro tasks or big freelance projects, the whole range of freelance work that can be done nowadays through, through platforms. Um, and I think it's really important actually precisely to situate the discussion around the gig economy and gig work within the wider context of work the labour market and the already in ex existing inequalities in that labour labour market. So please can we have on screen our three panellists who will be joining the panel today. Great to see Uma on screen. Hey Olivia. Anjali. And Grace. Great. So we're all in the same uh, virtual room, even though we're all four in different countries. So I have on my right, I have Uma Rani. Welcome. Uh, Uma's joining us today from Switzerland. She's a senior economist working at the research department at the International Labour Organization, or the ILO. So very warm welcome to you, Uma. Thank you for joining us today. Then we have Grace Natavalu, who is joining us from Kampala in Uganda. A very warm well, 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 welcome to you. Grace is research lead at Caribou Digital, and she's been doing some really interesting research on uh, the experiences of women in Nigeria, Kenya, and Ghana. And I look forward to hearing more about that today. So very warm well, welcome to you, Grace. And Anjali Krishan, who's joined us at the last minute to um, step in for Funda. Some of you might have been expecting Funda Ustek to be on screen uh, from Fair Work, but she's unwell. So Anjali has kindly uh, stepped in at the very last minute, and I'm really grateful that you can be here today. Um, Anjali is uh, also a postdoctoral researcher at Fair Work in Oxford, and she is leading the gender report that Fair Work will soon publish in the next few months. So a very warm welcome to you as well. So the first question um, that we have, uh, following on from everything that we've we've just heard from Jana, is many women across the world, as well as men, are joining platforms and have been joining platforms over the last few years to undertake numerous tasks. So anything from the very short micro tasks to, as I was saying earlier, the longer projects. And the first question is, what are the motivations for women to turn to the gig economy, to turn to platforms? Uh, to uh, earn an income and Uma, what what do we know from the research that you've been uh, carrying out for the ILO? Thanks a lot, Olivia, for this question, and I think it's very important. I think even before we jump into the whole question of motivations, I think uh, it would be very important for us to touch upon what were they doing in the labour market? Were they really engaged in the labour market before? you know, they got onto the platform work at all. And uh, we did these surveys at the ILO on micro task workers and freelance platform workers over the period 2017 to 2019. And it was very interesting to see that irrespective of, you know, whether you're talking about micro task or freelance work, a substantial proportion of these workers were actually working in the traditional labor market as employees. And this is about, you know, if you look at the proportions, it's 64% of the women in the freelance and 54% of the women in micro tasks. So that's huge numbers. Then you have a very huge substantial proportion of the workers ranging from 20 to 30%, depending upon the platform and depending upon the kind of work, uh, uh, a, a kind of work that they are doing, that they are unemployed. And then you have a small proportion of them who are in the self-employed. Now, even within the unemployed category, when you really look at it broadly and you start wondering, were they really unemployed or were they doing something during this time? You find again that there is a substantial proportion among them who are into education, but there is another part where they are actually taking care of 
children, old age people, or disabled people. So, you know, this is what the labor market looks like. And then when you start questioning them as to, you know, what is happening? Why do you get into this work? Part of the reason that comes out largely is that either they have to complement pay because the traditional labor market is not able to give them the kind of incomes that they need. And there's a large chunk of people who feel that they get into platform work largely because of the child care and old age care responsibilities they have to do. And platforms do provide some sort of a flexibility for them to get into it. So these stand out as some of the major reasons why uh, women enter some of this platform work. Though, you know, when you start probing them as to whether they really enjoy this work and how does it, how do they think about it? There are then reasons that come out saying, yeah, it does provide flexibility. The kind of jobs you do, especially in the micro task, are actually mind numbing jobs that really don't help them uh, related to the kind of education they have. So there are certain things that come out, which is not necessarily true when you look at freelance platforms. Thanks, Suma. And Jali, what have you found um, in your research and your colleagues' research at Fair Work? So thank you. That's a great question. I think it's really important to just caveat that uh, women workers are not a homogeneous group. It, like the experiences of someone who's doing micro work versus someone who's a freelance freelancer can be quite different. And so the motivations will vary based on that. It will vary based on what life stage they're at, what kind of care responsibilities, as well as the local cultural norms um, that are operational in the place where they're working. So for instance, in some societies, working from home might allow access to a new, um, might be more socially acceptable for a woman than in other places. So those issues come into place. And then added to this complexity is the fact that the nature of online web work is constantly changing with the use of increasingly sophisticated algorithms and like new technologies such as AI. So it's, it's kind of hard to like pin it down because it's a constantly changing and such a diverse things. But as Uma said, we do see that caregiving responsibilities and local cultural norms around not going outside of the house to work are two key motivations. We also see that sometimes they simply can earn more um, doing web-based work. So they would prefer to do that. Thank you. Thank you for um, uh, giving us an insight into the complexity of what we're talking about. Uh, Grace, you've done some research on three specific countries, on Nigeria, Kenya and Ghana. Um, can you paint us a picture, first of all, of what the gig economy looks like there and how, how, how much it's grown over the last few years and what sort of work are women engaging in? And um, also, if you could talk a little bit about the concept, the platform livelihood concept that you've and your colleagues have come up with, um, I think that would be really useful. Cool. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks to the previous speakers. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I guess I could start with uh, the definition that we use as Caribou Digital. So at Caribou Digital, we use the term platform livelihoods, and this goes beyond the big work uh, you know, freelancing, uh, those who are doing uh, driving, and we include uh, people who are running businesses either on social media or on e-commerce, or even someone who is renting out a property via Airbnb as a business, or even those who create content and make a bit of money online. So we call, we call, we use an umbrella term, platform livelihoods. And so in 2021, uh, through our research partners in Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria, we sought to understand the experiences of uh, young women between the age of 18 and 35, um, how they're using various digital platforms for work and selling. So we say working and selling. And so uh, we also try to understand how they are empowered through this work, something we are going to unpack later in this discussion. But as um, I think it's a known uh, 
well known that uh, numbers are hard to come by, especially around Africa. We really don't know how many people or young people are engaged in uh, doing this sort of work. But from our research, we were able to find uh, a considerable number of people who are that points to the, you know, that they recognize that there are opportunities online and they are taking on these opportunities. So I wouldn't know what the answer to the statistics uh, would be, but uh, I think it's probably a growing trend given the high unemployment numbers and the growing number of young people on the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, what was the other question? You've, you've discussed uh, platform livelihoods as going beyond uh, as a as as w the way that women especially uh, find work through social media platforms and other sorts of platforms, other types of platforms beyond the gig economy, um, and then do you, the the motivations for why women seek work through platforms. Have you got any insights into that? Uh -huh, thanks. Uh, so it's not too different from what Uma and Anjali shared earlier. Uh, we find that, of course, money is not the most, well, sorry, not the most important thing, but it's one of the important, while it might be an important thing, there are also other factors that uh, women consider. And of course, as Anjali said, it's not uh, this homogenous group, it's different women, mothers, whether they are students, whether they are unemployed, educated, uh, living in an urban area or rural area. So uh, aside from the money, as Uma also shared, um, some left jobs that they were no longer satisf satisfied with. Maybe they were, their efforts were not, uh, and time wasn't well paid for. So they thought, let me go do my own thing online. And at least uh, the time I put in is probably, you know, um, I'll get the money for that. And for some, uh, it is more of a side hustle, as we like to call it. You know, it's a thing that they don't decide with their nine to five job. And for some, they talk about uh, having some sort of financial freedom. They are making their own money. Maybe they previously didn't have a job and now this is uh, their way of earning something for themselves. So, and they speak of having to make to the ability now of, to make their own choices with the money that they make without maybe asking for help from family members or husbands, spouses and, um, also, others wanted to do things that they enjoy doing, like, you know, if they were making cakes for fun and realized, oh, I could actually do this business and sell, I could do this as a business and sell online, then I could enjoy my work, be creative, have room to experiment, start a business. And so those are some of the motivations. Mm -hmm. So, so this flexibility did come up, sorry. Yeah. Sorry? Flexibility also comes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so these three three words: flexibility, freedom, financial freedom. Also, Jenna talked about uh, safety um, as well as one of the motivations why, in the traditional labour market, uh, perhaps in some in some contexts, it's safer to work from home. So, thinking about the opportunities that platform work can offer women, and thinking about these concepts of flexibility, empowerment, entrepreneurship. Um, what can what can we say about these things in terms of opportunities, but also thinking about the narratives that are that have circulated around the gig economy since the beginning of uh, the growth of platforms? Anjali, should we hear from you? Yes. So I'm going to complicate things again. If we think of, I mean, gig economy really does sell itself as an empowering. A type of work in which you can make a lot of money, you can be your own boss and everything. But if we stop equating empowerment with financial freedom and financial independence, when you look at the actual experience of workers in gig economy, they're often highly surveilled. Um, it's often extremely isolating work. And it's, you know, it's, and effectively, you're kind of uh, incentivized to undercount your work value. So you, we often come across women workers particularly talking about how they underestimate the number of hours it took them to do a job, uh, that they will sometimes even, like if they don't feel like they did work well, they'll just ask the client to give them a good review and not give them a payment. So there are those type of things happening. So it's not necessarily a very empowering experience for these women. And the other thing that I just would like to bring up is that 
especially with microtasking, there's a lot of scams. Um, you, you have to like earn a certain amount of, you have to do a certain amount of work oftentimes to be able to, um, to get a payment and the app will just not let you get that amount of time. So people end up losing quite a bit of money. So it can be a very disempowering experience in reality. Mm -hmm. Uma, would you like to compliment or add on to what Anjali said? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, this is a very important question. I think there's this entire notion that exists that, you know, you get on work on the platform, you'd be empowered. I think we need to deconstruct the entire notion of empowerment. What do we mean by empowerment? Empowerment of what? I think for me, that's one of the fundamental things we need to do. Is it just because many of them have been part of the labor market? It's not that they have not been part of the labor market. So even the kind of social, economic, or financial empowerment that you're talking about, that existed, right? I think, I think one needs to look at this a bit more carefully and systematically deconstruct and try to understand what is the kind of story platforms are trying to sell. sell. Like, I think Anne has been asking a question about, you know, to what extent is there some sort of a control that women have, which is again a question of, are they empowered and is the work they do within their control? Now, I think if you were a genuine freelancer and you had the skills and the ability to do a particular task, you'd be really empowered because I have a control over the work, not only over the work about how it has to be done, but also about the pricing, right? Then I can really go about saying, this is the price I would command for this kind of a work to do. Now, for me, that would be the kind of empowerment that we can go about talking. But what happens in platforms? Now, even if you take the best of, which is a freelance platforms, where, you know, there's so much of talk about how a worker can also put a price for the work that they want to do. So they are free to do it. But I think what we forget in that entire narrative is that that price is based on what the global price is going to be. How many people are going to undercut you or how many people are you undercutting and getting at that price? So there's actually, it's in the global situation that you're saying, okay, you do that, you manage to get a project, okay? It looks as though, well, I have the flexibility. That's the other thing you were asking about. They have the flexibility to do the work whenever they want, wherever they want, and however they want. But in reality, this is not really so because many of the clients and the platforms, they ask the freelance workers to actually download certain hardware tools or software tools to be installed. And all the time that they're working on that project, they're actually monitored. So there's, I think Anjali talked about surveillance, but there's intrusive surveillance that is happening to the extent that Workers are asked to take screenshots and send it to the client or the platform. Now, what we interestingly saw, because, you know, surveys can help us to get some numbers, which are very important at times, not going beyond sometimes the anecdotal evidence that we gather from one or two stories. We were pretty shocked when we looked at our figures. We found that a larger proportion of women were asked to download and install uh, software and hardware uh, requirements. And what was even more interesting was when you start comparing who, which part of the world is being asked to do more. And this is like pure, you know, you talk about technology being neutral, you talk about everything being neutral and going about looking at it. And it was even more shocking for us to see that women from developing countries, a larger proportion of them were actually asked to do it. So where is the entire issue of flexibility if you are controlled by these mechanisms? And the third thing that we see is that, you know, often on these platforms, you have clients based in one part of the world and workers in another part of the world. And if you were a pure freelancer, you could do the work in your time and ask the client to be available also when it's feasible. But this is not what is happening on platforms. 
workers have to be available during the hours when the clients are available. So, you know, you're talking about US and say Philippines or India. So it's night and day. So where is the whole question around work-life balance and working during a social hours coming up? So, you know, all of this really makes you question, is it really as flexible as it is talked about? Is there really empowerment? What would happen if the woman would say, I cannot, I am not available during this hour, or I cannot take a screenshot and send it to you. What would happen immediately is you will not get a job next day onwards because you're going to be put a red bump. Mm-hmm. Right? So there are all of these challenges that are there for freelance, and it gets a bit more when you get on to the micro task. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Uma. Grace, any anything you'd like to add um, to this question? Maybe just to say, yeah, during uh, primary research, uh, women do recognize the pros and cons of flexibility. And one freelancer in Nigeria put it quite well, that the good thing about working on platforms is the flexibility and the bad thing about working on platforms is also the flexibility. And so they recognize these challenges. They talk about how like there's one freelancer in Kenya whose husband is also a freelancer, but she has to leave her work to do the house chores, feed the kids, cook for the husband and get back to work while he continues to work. And they, they even those who are not married still talk about uh, if they have extended families, they still have care duties that take them away from their work. So they don't get to put in as much time as they would like to. Uber drivers also shared because of safety issues. They don't have, they can't work all the hours that they want to work because they want to be home before dark, just so they are safe or pick the kids from school. So yeah, it does come up as a serious issue in, in our research. And but one of the things we found that for people with uh, disabilities, for example, it works for them because some sometimes they have uh, debilitating issues that then uh, sort of uh, need them to be more inside the house or at home. So working on platforms gives them a bit of uh, that flexibility to not have to move, stay home. But of course, they still ch- uh, face all the challenges that come with uh, working on platforms as women. Mm-hmm. So as Andali was uh, pointing out before, uh, not all women have the same experience. And uh, there are many nuances and uh, depending on your circumstances, you might find some great benefits to working through digital platforms, as Grace was just saying, in the case of if you have uh, some disabilities. So thinking about, um, you know, you've all mentioned uh, around talking about flexibility, how the how having care responsibilities in the home impacts how much one can enjoy, quote unquote, that flexibility that platform work would, would uh, say to offer. So what other obstacles are we seeing uh, in gig work, in specifically looking at freelance microtask, web-based gig work, that mirror the obstacles that we find in the traditional labour market offline and that Jana referred to um, in the keynote speech, um, Anjali? That's a really good question. I think... Um... I think the technology uh, used with these platforms ends up reflecting and then by default amplifying the existing gender um, gender narratives around gender narratives and gender norms. This does not necessarily have to be a bad thing, but it often is. Um, I think also one like it it's evolving it's in its own way. So one of the things that we see that's impacting both male and female workers in cloud work, uh, in uh, web-based platform work is that uh, oftentimes it's sort of gamified and it can become very addictive. And so we'll find people telling us that even though they don't plan to work, they're checking their phones, seeing if they're being reviewed, seeing if things are happening, and then they end up working a lot more than they had planned to work. And obviously, this has different um, impacts for a woman who may have caregiving responsibilities um, and a, a male worker, for instance. So those are some of the things that we do see 
coming out, like the, what the technology does actually does end up impacting how people in, uh, use the platforms and everything. Uma, you've done some work on gender pay gaps, which is something that uh, uh, we heard in the keynote speech is a still ongoing issue in, in the traditional labor market nowadays. Mm. How, what, what have you found in your research? on this or other obstacles and also connecting with what Anjali was saying? Yeah, I think I'll come down to the gender pay gap in a bit, but I think one thing I do want to draw your attention is that uh, there is a notion somehow we think that technology is gender neutral, somehow that, you know, you get onto these platforms and everything will be equated, there will be a lot of fairness and all of it. And I think uh, Anjali alluded to it, but I think the basic fundamental problem is that who designs these platforms? Who's behind it? It's humans. And who is it? Is it a male or a female? And even if you say, you know, women are engaged in designing these platforms, I hope there are more and more women, then the whole issue then even comes around how are you setting it up? What are your efficiency parameters or outcome parameters that you're looking at? And if your outcome parameter is that of efficiency rather than fairness, then the kind of things that you see already in the existing labor market would replicate that. So in a, to a very large extent, you know, when uh, some of the work that we've been doing using the surveys and we get these results saying that, you know, the participation of women on these uh, online labor markets is only 40%. And it's like, oh, what a surprise. No, there's no surprises. Because it's a replication of what happens in the gender, uh, in the traditional labor market. If you find taxi sector completely male dominated on platform, no surprises. That's how your traditional labor market works. So, right. So, what you see in the traditional labor market comes out very clearly here, whether you're talking about participation, whether you're talking about occupation segregation, where you find, again, more men engaged in software programming, coding, web development, data analysis, while women are much more into clerical, professional kind of tasks. So this is not new. This is not something, even though you find, I think what our survey goes about finding very interestingly is that a very high proportion of workers, women workers especially, are in STEM education, that is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. But if you start looking at the kind of work they do on these platforms, they are sometimes, a lot of them in micro task work, or they're doing business or clinical task work. And then you want to start asking the question, why are they getting into it? Is it also because the traditional labor market is not providing us with the kind of jobs that they could get into, which is also forcing them to get onto the platforms? So I think this is something that you very clearly see. And I feel that while we talk about platform regulation, on the other hand, you also need to think about alternative job opportunities. There was one thing that was very interesting we found in our survey. So, you know, there's also this notion that exists that, okay, there is probably not any discrimination that would happen because it's technology, right? And then on one of the freelance platforms, uh, Upwork, we found one of our respondents saying that, she had a male client who completely implied that a certain task would go over her head because she was a woman. So, you know, there's blatant discrimination that happens on these platforms too. So technology doesn't solve that problem. And finally, to answer your question about the gender pay gaps, you see these gender pay gaps very clearly. And part of the reason you see these gender pay gaps is because of the nature of occupation set they are in because the kind of tasks that they do are very low paid, low skilled tasks compared to the kind of tasks men get and the way they get paid. But even after you control for occupations and do everything, what you interestingly find is that on certain platforms, on certain types of tasks, there are gender pay gaps and in certain you don't see. And where you don't see it's interesting to see that women are very highly educated compared to men. 
So this speaks volumes about, you know, what's been happening on the platforms. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Uma. And Grace, um, any other obstacles that um, you've identified uh, that mirror the traditional labour market, perhaps some that we have some that we haven't mentioned so far? Yeah, I think I can mention two. And one would be the sexual harassment, verbal harassment and bullying. This is also happening online, whether it's uh, someone trying to sell something on social media because you, you have your name there. So if it's not even when it's a business page and they know that it's a woman behind it, women tend to be verbally abused or sexually harassed on there. And then uh, one freelancer shared how there was a client who asked her to do some work, but then later started sending her like, really terrible images. Uh, and you know that was through a freelancing platform. Of course, she reported and action was taken. Uh, but then we also see issues of safety. Women still don't feel safe, even when they are getting work through online platforms when they take on jobs as uh, drivers or of motorbikes or of uh, cars, they still worry about their safety. I know it also applies to men in certain cases, but of course women are more vulnerable than men, if I can say that. So I think these two things are the ones that, uh, yeah, I can add on to that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we're coming to the end of our of our panel discussion, unfortunately, because I would love to continue for an, at least another couple of hours. Um, so before we before we wrap up and uh, go on to the next section of the webinar, I'd just like to um, invite each one of you to have like a final reflection on on what we've discussed today and also perhaps going forward. Right. Um, any any reflections on on going forward and maybe grace um just uh, we'll start with you this time concluding any concluding re remarks yeah i think i can say that uh yes there are opportunities for women online but we all need to take note of the other risks that come with uh, finding and working uh, finding work online selling stuff online they are the same issues we talk about in the offline world. They're the same issues that women face on online. And I think we do need to do more research about women's experiences online and maybe platforms will understand better if they do care. They'll start to understand better that women have different experiences from men and the way maybe future platforms are designed or how policies are set up and, you know, Maybe these, these things can change as we go along, as we learn how women um, experienced uh, these platforms. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it Thank there. You. Thanks, Grace. And Jenny? I just like to really push for the need for more data on platform workers, women workers particularly, but really trying to like um, focus in on the workers experience of platforms because I mean platform work by its definition requires really good record keeping but we don't know how women uh, workers actually experience it what kind of issues they are facing and as I said right at the beginning we know it's a very complex thing we know that there are very different experiences based on a lot of different factors so we really do need much more data on this both quantitative and qualitative I would argue um, and only once we have that data can we actually really start understanding what kind of platforms work for women and what kind of platforms don't. Thank you very much. Uh, Uma, final, final remarks? Thanks a lot, uh, Olivia. I think I feel that we do know quite a bit about what's happening to women workers in a way. I guess we just also brought out a special issue on gender, women work in the digital economy as part of gender and development. We were looking at women's participation across various sectors and uh, also across global surveys that we have been doing on online microtask and freelance. And we've been talking to a lot of women. So we sort of know their experiences. We do know the complexities that exist. But for me, what is very, very important as a push forward to go is much more the whole question of the design and the development of the platform itself. 
and the platform algorithm. I think for me, that merits a very particular attention as of now. And I think what I would be more interested in is to see how we could have more transparency about how these platforms are designed and how the algorithms are set up and to also see how more women can get engaged in this design process and also in the policy process. I think while uh, we talk about having more transparency in setting this up, having parallelly the policy debate for platforms becomes important that it's not completely male dominated discussion, but you also have women in there participating and trying to see what works and what not. And we have also seen based on our other work in other parts of the world, how algorithms can itself be very biased towards males and not taking into consideration many of the demands of the women. And also to see how we could improve the traditional labor market. I think for me, that's at, as at most of importance as addressing things onto the platform. Because one of the reasons many women get onto the platforms is because they are not able to get many of these benefits that we talk about platforms having it in the traditional labor market. So I think to work parallelly on both these streams is what would be very important. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Uma, Grace, Anjali, for that great discussion um, and, and insights into the complexity of, of what we're talking about, actually. And what talking about the design and what can platforms do to, to take all of this into account and reduce some of those obstacles that we've discussed is precisely what we're going to be talking about next with um, Martin. So over to Martin and thank you very much to all of you for being here today. And thank you to our audience for listening. Over to Martin for the next uh, part of the session. <laughs>